Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome as we join together for worship this morning here at Whitehead Presbyterian Church. If you're visiting with us for worship this morning, let me encourage you and let me welcome you warmly to worship this morning. Before I go any further, may I wish all the fathers and all the men in the congregation a very happy Father's Day this morning. And I hope you, like me, got your breakfast in bed. Do not. Um, and so we want to welcome back Reverend Peter Boval, who will lead us in worship today. Now, before our announcements, I'm going to do the very un-Presbyterian thing here. Well, you have to go with me, I'm Peter's laughing, because we've chatted about this. You see maybe people along the back pews, if you want to come a wee bit further forward. I would encourage the choir, I would encourage us. I've even moved forward into the very front pew, so if you, if you feel the need, could I encourage you to come forward? Don't all rush at once, please. So, so. I'll just carry on with the announcements uh, while we're doing this. I, I invite you to stay after the service for a further time of fellowship and friendship over refreshments served in the welcome area. If you require the services of a minister, please contact myself or your district elder. And I have an announcement for members of Kirk Session. Uh, members of Kirk Session, there's a meeting short, a short meeting after uh, worship this morning in the church office. And so there will be three home groups meeting this week. There will be three home groups meeting this week. The office home group will meet for the final time before their summer recess in the church office this coming Monday at two from two o'clock. The home group led by Alec will meet, I think, for the final time uh, for uh, for their summer recess in the home of Helen and Lex on Tuesday evening from half past seven. And the home group led by Ronnie will also meet in the home of Trevor and Lorna from half past seven. I'm not sure if they're having a summer recess or not. And, uh, and so we, this coming week, uh, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland meet um, from Thursday onwards, starting at 10 o'clock. So please do be praying for members of Assembly. Pray for myself as your representative elder. And please be encouraged that you, uh, there's announcements on the screen that you're very welcome to come to any of the meet meetings uh, except for a closed session on Saturday morning. The communion service uh, uh, starts at 12 o'clock on Saturday, uh, so please be invited. If you're in Belfast, please do come in. Again, we meet for prayer on Saturday morning at, at 10 o'clock in the Bradley Room. And next Sunday, we have two services. Our morning service at 11 o'clock will be here in the church, and we're also having uh, an afternoon service at 4 o'clock and that'll be led by the home group. And so that's been postponed from two weeks ago. So if you know anyone who will come to the afternoon service, please do encourage them and come along with them. So I'm glad some of you have managed to come a bit far forward. Um, so thank you. We'll get you further forward in the coming weeks. But So these are all the announcements. Let us worship God. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Warren. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's great to be back here in Whitehead with you as we come to worship God together today. Um, it was a number of years ago that I saw this tweet, if you've heard of Twitter and tweets, it's now X and all that kind of stuff. But somebody wrote this. In the last 24 hours, I have been filled with routine faith moments where I have entrusted my life without flinching to a pilot I never saw, a barber I barely know who gave me a razor line, and a doctor I see annually who prescribed me pills. And often I doubt God. I hope you can see maybe what that person is saying. Every day we put ourselves into these 
faith moments where we trust someone else who we barely know. And yet often I think all of us can doubt God. Our lives are filled with moments of trust, moments of faith each and every day. And the big question is, who do we trust? Who do we trust? And we're continuing our journey through the book of Daniel. And we want to remind ourselves this morning of the God in whom we can trust. For every step we take in life, a God who's worthy of our trust, the God of grace, power, of wisdom and love and mercy. And so just as we come to God in worship today, I invite you just to, to pray, to pause, some silence. I'm going to read some verses and just guide our thoughts as we come to worship God this morning. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, as we come to worship you together as your people in this place. Father, this morning, our prayer, our heart's desire is that you would grow our faith, build our faith so that we might trust in you more. For those everyday moments of trust, faith moments. And so, Father, you know us. You know the burdens that we bring into church this morning those things that we are worrying about, those things that we're anxious about in the week ahead, those decisions that we need to make, those directions that we need to decide upon. And so, Father, this morning, we pray that you would show us more of who you are. Help us to hear your word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Father, hear us as we come and praise you this morning. Open our eyes to see more of who you are so we can trust you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing immortal invisible. <coughs> Join our hearts and minds in prayer. Now let's pray together. The psalmist writes, 
Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. Put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Father, as we have sung whose words are that most familiar hymn, as we have heard your word from Scripture, Father, we are hearing and listening and seeing more of who you are. And Father, our prayer this morning is that you would remove the scales from our eyes so that we can see more of your majesty and your goodness, to see that there's no one like you, that you are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. And Father, this morning we have come to worship you and you invite us to worship you, to shout for joy to the Lord, to worship the Lord with gladness. And so Father, this morning we pray that you would free us to worship you in spirit, and in truth, and to see more clearly with our finite minds the wonder of who you are, so that we might trust in you more. And Father, living in a world which displays the ugliness of sin and rebellion, we pray that more and more we would see your blessings to us, that we would recognise your hand of goodness and kindness on our lives. And Father, we acknowledge that the sin in our lives blinds us to the beauty of Jesus, the beauty of your plans and purposes for our lives. And we can journey down the road of worldly gain and glory so that our focus and gaze is slowly taken off Jesus. Father, today, fix our eyes on Jesus. Father, we are sorry when we are blinded to our sin, to the gossip, the lies, the angry words, the selfish actions, the laziness in our lives. Father, show us our sin so that we can come and say sorry for it. And we thank you that through Jesus our sin is removed as far as the east is from the west and we can stand before your throne of grace because of Jesus. We can say that you are our Father because of Jesus. And so, Father, hear our prayer together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now just for a few moments, maybe in the Sundays that I am here, we're going to try and learn together as a church family. And it is brilliant that Nika is here this morning. Hello, Nika. 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 Hi. How are you? Hi. Hello. No, I know your daddy's reading a book. Do you, would you listen to a little book that I'm going to read? Would that be all right? I'm going to read a little bit, just a couple of pages. I want you to be listening. We can all be listening and learning together. I want you to listen to the story or the picture that is painted in this story. And then we're going to learn something all together about God. And this is a book that a friend of mine wrote. I wonder if you can picture in your mind what is being said. When I look up on a sunny day, the sky is blue and bright and jet planes paint white lines on its canvas. When I look up on a stormy day, the sky is grey and dull and clouds pour rain and flash and boom with lightning and thunder. When I look up on a summer's evening, the sky is red and orange and purpley pink and the sun looks like it's falling from the sky on fire. When I look up on a clear night, the sky is dark 
and the stars twinkle and sparkle like diamonds. But the moon isn't always round. But Dad said the moon is always round, even when you can't see all of it. Now, Nika and everybody, it's quite a small little picture that you can't see, but we all know that when you look up into the sky at night, the moon isn't always round. Sometimes if you look up and it's just a little crescent moon, or a half moon, or a gibbous moon, or a full moon. But actually, even though we look up at night, and we only see part of the moon, we know that the moon is always round. Now, Nika, will you do some actions with me, will you? Will you? Will you? Is that okay? We can all do it actually, we can all learn together. I'm going to show you some Makaton signs. So this is the sign for the moon is always round. Can you do that? Let's all do it. The moon is always round. And that's true when we look up in the sky, when we have a clear night, we don't always see that the moon is round, but we know that it is right. And this reminds me something about God. Because the moon is always round. And the Bible tells us that God is always good. Nika, can you do that? Can you do that sign? God is always good. Brilliant. And no matter what age we are this morning, we can't always see the whole of God's goodness. We all know that there are situations maybe concerning our health or our family and our friends, or maybe life is hard, we're falling out maybe with our friends, or we look at the world around us, or even in the life of our church family, and we can't always see God's goodness and we're struggling to see the whole of God's goodness but the Bible tells us that even in difficult times that God is always good. There's goodness, the goodness of God even in the darkness and this morning we're thinking about trusting in God and that's a really important thing when we think about trusting God to remember that God is always good. Now, Nika, there's one last thing. Will we do our signs and remember those two things that the moon is always round and God is always good? Nika, you ready? You got, we'll do the moon. So the moon is always round. And that reminds us that God is always good. Brilliant. Nika, I want you to go home. You see when you're going to bed tonight, I want you to challenge your mum and dad to see if they remember those signs. Won't you? Would you do that? Brilliant. And that's something we can all remember. Signs are really helpful for, for helping us to remember. So no matter, maybe this is something when you look up into the sky and you see the moon and it might not always be round, I want each of us to remember that God is always good. We're thinking about trusting in God today. And maybe sometimes that you've experienced this. Maybe you're playing a quiz with your family or friends and you're stuck for an answer. And someone from the other team gives you an answer. I wonder, do you trust them? If the other team are giving you an answer, do you trust them? They're not on your side. Do you trust them? And that can happen again with all sorts of team games and sports. Do we trust someone who's on the other team? But just for a few moments, we want to remind ourselves that God is on our side. He's demonstrated that so clearly in history 2,000 years ago as Jesus died on the cross for us. And a huge encouragement is to remind ourselves God is on our side. He loves us beyond what we can imagine. And we're called to trust him. Romans 8 says this. 
What then shall we say in response to these things? God is for us. Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I suppose before we take some time to pray for ourselves, to pray for others, we're just mindful of those thoughts from Romans 8, but we're going to stand and sing words from Psalm 46. But again, just remind us who our God is, and then we'll pray together. God is our strength and rest. Thank you. Just before we take some time to pray together, it's just a couple of little um, updates that I just wanted to share with you. The last time I was here, which was about six weeks ago, I shared some news just concerning Adam Cree's health. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to update you on that. Back in the middle of May, Adam got some amazing news that the kidney tumour had gone. And that was a great answer to prayer. We want to give thanks to God for God's hand on Adam. But Adam still experiences a number of, of different symptoms that are challenging for him. And so we just want to continue to pray for God's hand on Adam for full healing and for Adam and Hannah and the kids in these days. I'm not sure exactly what I mentioned that, that last time, just about what's going on in the background, about ministry here in, in Whitehead. But a number of weeks ago, we um, advertised the post of an auxiliary ministry post here in, in Whitehead. That's someone who would come and take um, a couple of services a, a month and do some pastoral work, do about 20 hours um, of preparation and, and work within the life of the church family here in, in Whitehead. Um, that post went out and was advertised to those who've been trained as auxiliary ministers. We have had three applicants. And so over the next number of weeks, the Kirk session will be interviewing those people and thinking about the next stages of that process. And so we'd really appreciate your prayers as we just consider the next step and who might come here and, and share in ministry in the life of your church family in the coming months. I just want to pause, I want to pray. We want to pray for ourselves, we want to pray for others, we want to pray for the life of our church.
fell away. So let's pray together. We hear those words from the Bible, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Father God, we thank you that the one in whom we trust today is so faithful, so loving, so merciful, so gracious and so kind to us. Father, you are the only one who we can know is, is perfect in every way, the only one who is worthy of our trust. And Father, we come and give you thanks for just your hand on Adam over these last weeks. Father, we thank you for your work of healing in his body. But Father, we continue to pray for him, that he would just know full healing, that you place your hand upon him, give him health and strength. And in these days, Father, continue to give him the faith to trust in you. Father, we pray that you would surround them as a family, Adam, Hannah and the kids, that they would just know your presence in such a special way. And Father, for those here this morning, for those in the life of this church family, we want to pray for trust in you when life is difficult. That reminder that you are always good. And so, Father, we pray for families who are mourning in these days. We want to pray for those in the midst of health challenges, of family difficulties, of work, stress, of uncertain futures, those who are anxious and worried in these days. Father, we pray that we and those people who came to our minds, Father, might know that you are on our side that you are perfect in love and patience and mercy and grace towards us. And Father, in the week ahead, we are mindful of the meeting of the General Assembly. And so Father, we just ask your blessing upon that, those meetings. Father, we pray for wisdom as decisions are made regarding particularly the work in, of mission here in Ireland. Plans regarding international meeting point and rural chaplaincy and the future church development in Ireland. Father, we pray for great wisdom. But Father, we thank you that we know we are part of something bigger and we are better together and we can know your blessing as we work together and meet together. And so Father, we pray that you just bless those three days of meetings and worship and that you'd be in the midst of it all. And Father, we are, I want to thank you for this church family here. My head on, a, on Father's Day, we are particularly mindful of being family. And Father, for so many people here, we have had spiritual dads, spiritual mums, spiritual grannies and grandas, those people who walk with us in our journeys of faith and continue to do that here in this church family. So Father, we thank you for that. And we pray for unity and protection and encouragement in these days for this church family. And Father, as we, in these next number of weeks, the Kirk session move forward in, in relation to this auxiliary ministry post and someone who will come and do mission and ministry among us, Father, we pray for just a clear leading, for your hand upon that process and really unity as we move forward. Father, we thank you for your promises to us that you are with us. Father, we thank you for your presence and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we read from Daniel 2, I'm just going to introduce these verses. Daniel 2 is quite a long chapter, so we're only going to be reading part of it. And so I just thought I'd just introduce um, it um, to you. I, I don't know about you, but maybe when you're flicking through TV channels, you might come across a program that is a bit of a blast from the past. Maybe you come across the A team or a Lua Lua, something that's a blast from the past. And up until recently, I would have called this program a blast from the past gladiators. But I don't know if you took the opportunity to watch gladiators afresh in the last number of months as BBC brought it back. But for me, the memories of the show was growing up in the 90s. It was all about the contestants coming onto the show, taking part in a number of contests against the gladiators. But my favourite contest was this, the duel, gladiator versus contest or contestant. Who would win? Who would have more strength, wisdom, power? Who was going to win 
the jewel. The book of Daniel presents to us many jewels, a contest between God and a worldly king, between God's people and an earthly king, between God's kingdom and the kingdoms of the world, a book full of jewels, contests, trying to answer the question, who is king? And Daniel chapter 2 is no different. And just a little bit of background before Lex comes and reads Daniel chapter 2 to us. King Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream. He's troubled by it, but he's forgotten the dream. And he desires to know both the dream and its interpretation. And so he calls his magicians, his sorcerers, his astrologers and enchanters. And he gives them this task. Tell me the dream and tell me its interpretation. But as you can imagine, the wise men are stumped. They repeatedly ask the king, tell me the dream and I'll tell you the interpretation. But the king is telling them nothing. And so we jump in at verse 10. I love you if you've got your pew Bibles to turn to Daniel chapter 2. I'm sorry, I don't have the page. 840. Right, 884. I'd love you to turn to Daniel chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 10 to 23. Lex is going to read that to us as we jump into the story at verse 10 of Daniel chapter 2. Thanks, Lex. The astrologers answered the king, There's no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king However great and mighty has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent out to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went in to the king and asked for time, so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me power and wisdom. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Amen. Thank you, Lex. Just before we take some time to think about these verses, we're going to stand and sing the splendor of the king.
you'd like, turn back to Daniel 2 from page 8, 4, just of your few Bibles as we pause to consider these verses this morning. As I said, the question is, who is the king? From the outside looking in, King Nebuchadnezzar surely is in the running for answering that question. King Nebuchadnezzar, as we find him here in the book of Daniel, is found in many other secular records of this time. He's remembered as the greatest king of ancient Babylon. He's been known as a brilliant military tactician strategist. He's secured an alliance between the Medes and the Babylonians through marriage. According to some sources, he had the hanging gardens of Babylon built for his new wife to remind her of her homeland in Persia. Under his reign, Babylon has become the most powerful city-state in the region. Nebuchadnezzar himself, the greatest warrior, king and ruler in the known world. That's really quite the CV. However, Daniel chapter 2 shows the weaknesses in this king. And from the very beginning of the chapter, we see this great king is troubled. He's suffering from sleeplessness over a dream he can neither remember or interpret. That is, an entourage of wise men are no use. The wisdom of this world is left exposed, and it's the anger of the king, which is about to be the lasting memory as he cries off with their heads. And as this true story continues, it is the wisdom of God. That is revealed to Daniel. God gives Daniel the dream, but not only that, God gives the interpretation, if we were to read on, an interpretation that speaks of the future of coming kingdoms and ultimately a kingdom that will last forever, God's kingdom. And we see again that God is king. It's in God that we find all the wisdom and all the power. And these events remind us that even in the greatest of human rulers, they are nothing compared to God. That does speak into our lives as we maybe consider where we put our hope. Our country, our province, over these last years has been on a real political roller coaster. And with that has naturally come, I'm sure, a certain level of apathy towards politics and politicians. In the midst of an election season, and bearing in mind over these last years, we could very likely feel we're just suffering from political exhaustion. But no matter what level maybe of exhaustion that we might have towards politics and politicians, we might still look towards our politicians with some measure of hope that they'll get it sorted. And do we in some way trust them that they will find the wisdom to bring us through. But God tells us through Daniel 2 that he is the source of all wisdom and that the rulers of our lands are in his hands. And if we're looking for wisdom, God is the source. And so there's that question, where do we place our hope? Our hope should not be in the politicians and government, because as we've discovered, they at some point will let us down. Our hope should be in God. And I think this can lead us and guide us in a number of different ways. Two ways that I want to leave with you at this point as we think of politics and politicians and where we place our hope. But firstly, peace. When we live in uncertainty, whether that's here in Northern Ireland, across the UK, across the world, we can naturally cause us to be concerned about the future when there's uncertainty. How is it all oh, the future in politics? How is it going to affect the education of our kids? How is it going to affect the health care? How will there ever be any positive solutions to the different conflicts around the world, whether it's in Ukraine or the Middle East? How will these economic challenges that we're facing as a nation, how are they going to be addressed? Will we be able to maintain some good standard of living? What about all these questions of climate change? And the questions go on and on. The uncertainty goes on and on. But God wants to remind us that he 
his king. But the governments and powers of this world are held in his hands. And we can know a peace when we put our hope and our trust in him. I think that's a challenge to myself and maybe to you, is how we live out that peace in our daily lives. Do we show that we are trusting in God, that we have a peace about all that's going on in the world around us? Can we show that peace in the words that we say and the things that we do that speak that actually with everything going on, we are trusting in God? I think it does lead us and move us to pray. To pray that God would graciously and mercifully give wisdom and knowledge to our politicians. I only discovered in the last number of years that both houses in Westminster begin with prayer. The speaker's chaplain usually reads this prayer, or the form of a main prayer. Is it, is it on the screen? Yeah, it's this here. This is what is prayed before the, any of the sessions in both houses. That they, they, they pray this, Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, grant to our that's meant to be king and his government, to members of parliament and all in positions of responsibility, the guidance of your spirit. May they never lead the nation wrongly through love of power, desire to please, or unworthy ideals, but laying aside their all private interests and prejudices. Keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all mankind. So may your kingdom come and your name be hallowed. It's not quite amazing that in this day and age, before the houses, both houses in, in Westminster open, that this prayer is said. And so we're going to pray, especially this time of elections, with elections just two, couple of weeks, three weeks away, to pray for our politicians, mindful of God at work among them and um, um, in their lives as, as well. So we're just going to pause and we're going to pray um, that God would be at work. So let's pray, pray together. Father, your word tells us this. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, grant to our king and to his government, to members of parliament, and all in positions of responsibility, the guidance of your spirit. May they never lead the nation wrongly through love of power, desire to please, or unworthy ideals, but laying aside all private interests and prejudices, keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all mankind. So may your kingdom come and your name be hallowed. Father, we want to share that prayer for our politicians, whether here in Northern Ireland, Stormont, or over in Westminster. Father, in this election season, we pray especially for grace and truth in the midst of electioneering. Father, we pray that truth would be heard, that grace would be shown. Father, we pray that you would instill integrity and strength to those who will be elected and will help them to put the welfare of everyone first above their own ideals and desires and father we want to thank you for those who serve us in stormont and council and westminster but father we want to thank you for the many committed christian men and women who are serving as elected representatives across the uk Father, we pray that you would help them to be effective light and soul in these days. Father, we pray that you would help us to trust in you to be at work within the structure of government in our land. And we pray all these in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to return to Daniel 2 just for the next few moments. But I wonder... What is your response when danger looms? What's your response when danger looms? A number of times over the last years, we have had a couple of incidences in the months. 
There was no need to phone the police, we're glad to say. There may have been the need to phone a carpet cleaner. Because <laughs> this little fellow fell down the chimney and into the living room. And next time I will believe my girls when they say they hear a bird in the chimney. But unfortunately it flew straight to a window from which I was able to get hold of it and take it outside. But what I find is really interesting is the responses to danger. Rushing around, a little bit of panic. The, gee, the girls are peering in to have a look, but not venturing too far into the room. Jackie is quickly pulling back the blinds to open the windows. And they say there's a number of responses when we're faced with danger. Fight, flight, freeze, or faint. I'm not sure if you've experienced any of those in recent days. But maybe these responses might be more appropriate if you find this fellow in your house. That's what happened to a family in the US after a bear had let itself into their house, made a bit of a mess and then went to sleep in the wardrobe. But what is our immediate response to danger? How do we respond to danger? For a few moments, I just want us to consider Daniel's response to the real and present danger he and his friends face when King Nebuchadnezzar's execution order was made. But what's really encouraging for us is that we see just this overall picture of trusting God. At the heart of this story, we see our trust in God. And at the heart of trust is believing, believing what God says to us and living our lives by it. Believing what God says to us <coughs> and living our lives by it. We believe that God loves us. He's demonstrated that amazing love for us through the death of Jesus. We believe that God loves us and then when we believe that, it moves us into a greater trust in God. Trusting in the God who's described in Daniel to. It's an amazing, a wonderful description of the God that we're called to trust in. It's from verse 20. If you have your Bibles open, you can see it. Let's read to us. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and disposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. Trusting in God each moment. That's what these verses want to encourage us to do each moment. Because every day we have moments of trust. And trusting in God, however, is more than just a passive believing thing. It's just more than knowledge in our minds. We want to let that knowledge drop to our hearts and from our hearts motivate our wills and shape our actions. We want to follow in Daniel's footsteps in our daily lives, no matter what we might be facing, to trust in God and to know that we are more loved than we could ever imagine that we can actively trust God, trust the wisdom of his word, trust the leading of his spirit, trust his plans for your life, trust your security in him, to believe that we can trust in him. And from Daniel's life, I just want to suggest four things that we can see in Daniel's life in this story that we might be able to learn from. And the first thing, that we see in verse 14 is a calm response from Daniel. When the immediate situation arises, we see a calmness in Daniel's response. He demonstrates a wisdom and a calmness in the question that he asks and the tact in how he handles the situation. I'm not quite sure I would be as calm and as tactful as Daniel if I was faced with an execution order. And it's just the right thing. How can we day by day be able to respond calmly to the situations that we find ourselves. And I think that can maybe begin with an awareness that God is with us in our day by day lives, our daily lives. And maybe beginning 
our days by reminding ourselves of that just awareness of God with us. Maybe that's opening up our Bibles, reading some verses, maybe saying a prayer. I came across this from someone who reminded themselves every day, every morning of some really important truths. And they said, each morning they reminded themselves, I think the truths are here, yeah, yeah. Each morning they get up and they encourage us in this way. They said, say it over and over to yourself, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, as you wait for the bus, anytime your mind is free, ask that you may be enabled to live as one who knows all these things utterly and completely true. That I'm a child of God, that God is my father that heaven is my home, that every day is one day near, that my saviour is my brother, and every Christian is my brother too. It's something that reminds us, an awareness of God with us and God's love for us. I wonder if this awareness of God, who he is and how he is with us, might just give us a calmness in our response to danger or challenge. And so a calm response. I'm thinking how just an awareness of God in our lives might enable us to have that calmness. And then verse 16, a confidence in God. Daniel's confidence in God caused him to go and ask for time. Time to interpret this dream. Even in the midst of the situation when there doesn't seem to be any real resolution, Daniel demonstrates just a trust and confidence in God. And that's hard. Because in the midst of our situations, the difficult situations that we find ourselves, when our vision is limited, we only see the brick wall that's right in front of us. We really struggle to have perspective and insight sometimes, to see that there's hope or light beyond. But our confidence in God is something that we want to foster before the challenge arises. I remember an author of a book on suffering he was speaking at a conference that I was at and he was speaking about his own life and how he had written this book on suffering. But he found it difficult in the midst of the difficult times when he was in the midst of it. That's, that's not the right time to read his book. It's so hard to read and to think about suffering in the midst of it. Instead, it was about being ready before the suffering came to know what he already believed in when it came to God to know that his confidence was in God in the here and now no matter what he was about to face and so it was about building our confidence in God ahead of those difficult times in life so a calm response a confidence in God and think about building our confidence in our God before the challenges come and then verse 18 pleading I'm praying. Daniel remembered that God was king, the God of the wisdom and the power, that God graciously moves in our lives, that God graciously gives us what we need, that God is to be trusted, that God is our hope. And so Daniel pleaded and prayed to God, not only on his own, but I think really encouraging with others. He prayed with his friends. And so can I encourage you in those challenging times to look to God, to plead and pray to God, but not just do that on your own, but to pray to God and to let others pray with you and for you. And actually maybe we've experienced it when we're in difficult times and we can't pray ourselves. And that's when we experience the joy of Christian community and others praying for us and with us. And so when we face difficult times, we're looking for that calm response, that awareness that God is with us. We want that confidence in God and building that confidence in God in the here and now for the challenges that will come. To respond with pleading and praying and involving others in pleading and praying with us and for us. And then lastly, in verse 20, we see praise and thanks. And Daniel rightly stopped and he gave thanks to God for God's gracious intervention in his life. And this is an opportunity to remind ourselves of who God is and what he has done. To give God the glory. 
Well, we probably not faced death at the hands of a king. We probably not had God give us a dream and an interpretation that has saved our lives. But just in these next few moments as we turn to prayer, I'd love you to pause and remember those times when you have known God intervene in times of challenge. In a few moments, the offering is going to be taken. I want to encourage you, just as the offering is taken, to, to reflect and to remember, to look back over your life, to remember a time when God has brought you through a challenge, when trusting in God's wisdom has brought blessing, when God has encouraged you through times of suffering. What do you have to give thanks to God for today? Maybe another time when God has been at work in your life, when you can look back and see God's power and wisdom, when God has given you all that you've needed. Like Daniel, we want to pause and give thanks and praise to that God who is with us in those challenging times. I encourage you during the offering to reflect back and then we're going to pause and pray together and give thanks. If those collecting the offering could just leave the offering baskets on the table and then return to your sheets and then we'll pray together. So just during as the offering is collected, just pause to remember what do you have to give thanks and praise to God for today. Your offering will now be received. Thank you. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you that our journey with you through life is one that moves us to trust in you more. One aspect of trusting you more is you move us to be generous, to give what you have given to us, and whether that's our time or our gifts or our money, back to you. We trust you because you promised to provide all that we need. And so, Father, we pray for the offering that's before us, that we use it to bless your people in this place, to bring glory to your name and to build your kingdom. And, Father, as we continue to reflect, as we reflect on our lives, remember those times, Father, that you have brought us through, that you have given us the wisdom that we have needed, that you have, we can see so clearly that you've been at work in our lives that you've brought us through those difficulties and challenges and dangers. Father, no matter what we were thinking about in those moments during the offering, Father, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness and your kindness, for your patience and your courage and your strength that you gave to us. We thank you for your love for us in Jesus and that awareness of your love for us. So, Father, we give you thanks with all of our hearts. We sing your praise because, Father, you are the great God. And we thank you, Father, that as your word tells us, that you can be our refuge, that you can be a stronghold in times of trouble, and you call us to trust in you. And so, Father, as we reflected on Daniel's life, as we reflect on our own 
lives and the challenges and difficulties that we face. We pray, Father, that we'd be able to, to learn from Daniel. But Father, that we would leave this morning in which our faith is growing as we've seen more of you, our great God, and that we are more willing to trust in you for each moment, each step. And so, Father, you know us. You know those things, Father, that we do need to hand over to you, that we really need to trust you for, that we, those things in which we really need to believe your promises to us, that you are with us, that you're at work in our lives, that you never leave us. And so, Father, we pray, Father, for that faith, the trust in you more each day, each moment. And as we do that, Father, we pray that the glory and praise would go to you. And so, Father, as we close our service and song, Father, may this song be our prayer from our hearts as we look to the coming days. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing and close our service with Be Thou My Vision. <coughs>
Can I thank you for being with us here today? Can I encourage you? Is there refreshment? To stay for refreshments that will magically appear over to my right. It'd be really welcome. And just then, that final reminder just for Kirk's session, we'll meet um, quickly after the service to enable you get back and share refreshments with everybody. But let's say the grace to each other as we close our service. And now, the may the grace of our, of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, the love of God, God and the and fellowship of the Holy the Spirit, Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. 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 Thank you.